So, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where, where you're watching this today. Um, my name is Alex Kirkop, and I'm one of the co-chairs for the CNCF Storage Tag. And we're talking today about cloud-based storage, the landscape, and some of the projects in the CNCF. I'm here with my co-presenters, uh, Jing Yang and Raffaele, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Thanks, Alex. Hello, everyone. I'm Xin Yang. I work at VMware in the cloud native storage team. I'm also one of the co-chairs in Storage Tag. And my name is Rafael Spassoli. I am a consulting architect at Red Hat. Cool. So let us talk a little bit about what we're covering today. So we're going to cover um, an overview of the tag and talk a little bit about how you can take part in the community and how you can contribute. We're going to have a little look as to why cloud native storage is something you should be considering and why that's important and the review of some of the white papers um, that we've been working on in the tag, including the cloud storage um, uh, landscape documents, our data on Kubernetes document, a performance document and a, a disaster recovery document. So. A little bit about the tag. Uh, the tags uh, in the CNCF are the technical advisory groups. They um, help advise and uh, act as subject matter experts in, in different uh, areas that the CNCF works in. So we're the storage tag. There's also um, other tags like security and runtime and app delivery um, and networking. Um, our meetings are all open. We would love to hear more from you and to hear from um, maintainers of projects as well as um, other uh, people who are interested in storage. Um, all of the calls are open. They're on the second and fourth Wednesday of um, every month. Uh, and those are the links which um, you can use to uh, to join the meetings and look at our previous minutes and presentations. Um, a little bit about who we are. It's a mixed group of people. Um, some represent uh, vendors, some people represent projects, and some people um, are, are independent. We have a number of co-chairs, the three of us, which are um, in the group today, as well as a number of technical leads. So Louise, Sheng, and, and Nick, um, who, who join us as technical leads. Um, and each uh, tag also has a number of members with the TOC that we work with that, that are um, liaisons for our tag, and that's Nikita and Matt in our case. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out on our mailing list, and we're also on the CNCF Slack groups. So a little bit about what we do. Um, as the CNCF continues to grow and the number of projects within the foundation continues to grow, one of the challenges that that uh, we're trying to um, overcome is, is the sheer amount of scale and diversity and variety of, of projects in the CNCF. So part of the reason why we we have the the tags it's it's to help the CNCF scale to help provide extra levels of expertise for the for the TOC um, as we continue to to grow the the huge interest in in cloud native computing. So what does this actually mean? We do a number of things, including um, uh, educating, like in in sessions like this, but also in the uh, white papers and and various. Um, documents that, that we write to kind of explain the ecosystem and explain the, the options and the projects in the in the environment. Um, we work with the TOC to review projects that are going through the various um, phases within the CNCF. And we obviously engage with the user com community whilst we provide the subject matter expertise. Um, there are already um, a large number of uh, projects within the CNCF in the in the storage ecosystem. Uh, we have a large <clears throat> um, we have a large group of projects um, at the sandbox stage, and you can click on the link to have uh, a look at some of those sandbox projects. And we also have uh, incubating and graduating projects. Incubating uh, incubating projects include. Um, projects like Dragonfly, uh, KubeFS, and Longhorn. Um, Dragonfly provides um, uh, a container uh, services. Uh, Longhorn provides a variety of 
hyper-converged um, uh, block services and KubeFS is a new interesting distributed file system. And then in graduated projects, we have everything from projects like etcd, which is a key value store that you're all going to be familiar with in the running of your Kubernetes clusters, um, Rook, which is uh, an operator for uh, Ceph, um, Vitesse, which is um, uh, a very large scale distributed uh, MySQL option, TIKV, which is a distributed uh, and sharded key value store, and Harbor, which is another container system. Um, the sandboxes go through um, go through different levels. Um, uh, most projects start their voyage in, in the CNCF as a as a sandbox. Um, the the, pro the sandbox projects are there to help build the community. Sometimes just provide experiments um, and and help guide the the foundation and the project. Incubation projects are are where projects reach a maturity level where they're used in. Um, production. Incubation is also where the vast majority of the due diligence takes place. Um, and, uh, you know, the projects have to be in use in, in production in a large number of um, sites to, to, to get to incubation status. Um, and finally, the last step is graduation, where we have um, a, a, a final phase of, of security audits and another, another final checks on the governance of the project, for example, to get to that to that final stage. Um, a little bit about cloud native storage. So why are we why are we talking about cloud native storage and, and, and what does it even mean and why should you be interested? So ultimately, and I'll be a little controversial here, but I'll come out and say it, I think um, every application needs to store state somewhere. There is no such thing as a stateless application and you know, we we talk about um, uh, the way we run applications in in Kubernetes, but ultimately, um, your databases, your message queues, and, and and everything else that the database, sorry, that the application needs to run, um, needs to be operating somewhere, and and they can operate on a cloud using cloud native patterns, and they can obviously operate in the more traditional sense. So. As um, organizations mature their cloud native environments, their move to Kubernetes, um, they want to uh, adopt the, the capabilities and, and the facilities that, that we have in our declarative environments in Kubernetes, where we use those cloud native patterns to enable automation and scale and, and facilities for, for failover and performance. And we'll talk a bit about some of the disaster recovery and, and other functions here. And certainly we're now at the stage where there's a very broad ecosystem that supports cloud native storage with um, very uh, robust and mature CSI driver capabilities within Kubernetes itself, as well as a vast variety of operators that allow you to run databases, message queues, and, and, and many other services uh, in Kubernetes too. So the time is now to come and try these things. Um, so I'll hand over to Jing now, who's going to talk a little bit about our storage landscape white paper. Thanks, Alex. Now I'm going to talk about the CNCF storage landscape white paper. In this white paper, we described storage system attributes, different layers in a storage solution, and how they affect the storage attributes. We talked about the definition of data access interfaces and management interfaces. Next, please. Storage systems have several storage attributes, availability, scalability, performance, consistency, and durability. Availability defines the ability to access the data during failure conditions. Availability can be measured in uptime as a percentage of uh, availability. Scalability can be measured by the ability to scale the number of clients, throughput, or number of operations, the capacity and the number of components. Performance can be measured against latency, the number of operations per second, and the throughput. Consistency refers to the ability to access newly created data or updates after it has been committed. A system can be either eventually consistent or strongly consistent. Strong consistency is synchronous. Eventual consistency is asynchronous. Durability is affected by the data protection layers, levels of redundancy, 
the endurance of the social media and the ability to detect corruption and recover the data. Next, please. There are several storage stacks or layers that can impact the storage attributes, including host and operating system, storage topology, data production layers, additional data services provided by the storage system, and the physical non-volatile layer. That's all for the storage landscape web paper. Next, please. We are collaborating with the data on Kubernetes community on a white paper that describes the patterns of running data on Kubernetes. The paper is complete, ready for review. In this paper, we talked about attributes of storage system and how they affect running data in Kubernetes. We compiled running data inside versus outside of Kubernetes. What are the common patterns and features used? And in the first version of this paper, we are focusing on databases. However, most of the things we described here apply to other data workloads as well. Next, please. We talked about the storage attributes of a storage system earlier. For a cloud native database, the kind of uh, backend store used the number of replicas and so on all have an impact on attributes such as availability and durability. Cloud native databases typically use sharding to facilitate hor uh, horizontal scaling. For example, Vitas uh, graduated CNCF project has a built-in sharding feature to scale MySQL horizontally. We added uh, two new attributes observability and elasticity here. In cloud native environment, typically there are different services running in a distributed fashion. When a failure occurs, it is hard to know which component is causing the problem. It's even more important to have comprehensive observability system. This will help us detect problems early and prevent a failure from happening. Elasticity means the ability to scale up and down quickly. This is on-demand infrastructure. It refers to the, the ability to release resources that are no longer needed. This can also mean storage tiering, where you can move data to different tiers, depending on how often you need to access them. For storage stacks, I mentioned earlier that the different layers of storage system can have an impact on the attributes. This is true for running data in Kubernetes as well. Regarding DR, Raphael will talk more about this one later. Next, please. There are options to run data inside or outside of Kubernetes. Deploying and operating databases without proper automation is not recommended. So there are many two alternatives. There are managed databases services provided by most cloud providers. We, uh, you can also run databases inside Kubernetes. This can provide multi-cloud and cross-cloud capability. Running databases inside Kubernetes is typically facilitated by an operator. It leverages Kubernetes declarative API and reconciles the active state with the desired state. With databases managed by a Kubernetes operator, it automates day two operations such as backup and restore, upgrade, migration, etc. It can also leverage other tools such as Prometheus and Grafana for monitoring. Next, please. When running data in Kubernetes, we see many common patterns and features being used. And operators usually use to facilitate the running data in Kubernetes. There are things to consider when writing an operator. We need to decide what configuration knobs should be visible to the user. There are trade-offs between flexibility versus complexity. An operator should handle periodic operations, support upgrade, especially non-disruptive upgrades. 
handle different uh, CRD versions and so on. Many operators use persistent volumes to store data in Kubernetes. These persistent volumes are typically provisioned by a CSI driver. CSI driver allows underlying storage to be consumed by containers running in Kubernetes. That's all I want to cover for the data on Kubernetes by paper. Now I will hand it over to Alex to talk about the performance by paper. Thank you, Jing. <clears throat> so as we built up um, the, the the various white papers and, and we discussed the attributes, um, after availability, one of the most common things that, that um, we get questions on is performance. So we started writing the performance white paper uh, and you can see more in the link uh, on screen now. Um, in the performance white paper, we look at um, some of the definitions and the terms um, so that we can um, uh, bring you up to speed on a lot of the concepts that we can use for measuring performance for both databases and uh, volumes. And then we pick those two as as they, they, they seem to be the most um, uh, the most in demand at the moment. Um, some of the things that we cover during um, uh, in, in the white paper include uh, understanding the differences between, for example, the operations per second, which are typically needed um, in applications which might be latency sensitive or, or do lots of uh, small operations um, uh, together. So, you know, think database um, queries, for example. Um, versus uh, throughput, where you're probably doing a smaller number of operations with, with larger data sets and, and are more um, focused on uh, the, the amount of data that can be processed, perhaps measured in megabytes per second or gigabytes per second. So think more analytics or, or data warehousing type operations. And of course, in all of these, um, uh, in all of these uh, systems, the way the storage is laid out, the data protection in terms of, say, erasure coding or replicas, the data reduction in terms of uh, DTUP or compression, or or even the um, security in, in data encryption, all play a part uh, in the overall um, performance. And there are often compromises to be made across all of those. But ultimately, the latency of the different components is probably the single biggest uh, determinant, um, both in terms of throughput and, and, and operations per second. Um, and because latency is that challenge, we have to understand how to uh, make the storage environments as concurrent as possible. And, and, and that involves, you know, managing the depth of the queues, but also the number of queues and the number of clients and the number of backends that, that the system can, can scale across. If you, if you only have one thread hitting one connection, there's only so many things you can do in parallel because you can, you're serialized by that single connection. So concurrency is is is, a, is, a, is one of those um, big challenges. But the other big challenge is understanding the caching at each of the different layers. You know, and you have caching at um, file system, database, often storage system, and even at the individual disk level. Um, and and those and 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 therein lie some of the some of the um, the traps, I guess, if you wish, in in how you understand the performance benchmarking for your environment. So when you're when you're testing that, it's very important to um, to understand if you're testing um, a data set that actually does need to fit in memory and does need to fit in cache, or whether the data set is going to be ex expanding and and be larger than that cache. The the most important takeaway here is not to trust blindly um, the, the numbers that uh, any particular storage vendor or database vendor um, uh, use in, in their environments because your environment will differ in many different ways and it's important to test your own application in your own environment um, with, with your own use case when you're comparing uh, different systems. In fact, as we were writing this document, we, we realized that performance benchmarking is actually pretty pretty hard and there are so many caveats um, to to be aware of and, and there's there's also a large uh, section on caveats within the document 
Um, and with that, I'll hand over to uh, Raffaele, who's going to uh, give you an update on our Cloud Native Disaster Recovery Paper. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, so we um, we wrote this uh, white paper, the Cloud Native Disaster Recovery White Paper, to describe an approach to doing disaster recovery, which of course we call Cloud Native Disaster Recovery. This is an option that we think is important and that we think people should know about. Uh, it's not um, it's not obviously we are not saying that you have to use it, but we think it it's uh, it's a good option. We think we should consider it. So let's see uh, how cloud native disaster recovery is dis distinguished from uh, traditional disaster recovery. And we have this table here to point out some of the differences. Um, so, for example, for uh, the deployment of your application with traditional disaster recovery, you often end up doing active passive, um, especially for the stateful application for the storage application, which is what we're talking about here. And instead, cloud native disaster recovery, we say you should do active active. You should pick a, a product, a middleware, a database that can do active active. For the trigger of um, De detecting the disaster and, and the trigger of the recovery procedure with traditional disaster recovery, it's usually a human decision. With cloud native disaster recovery, this middleware software can uh, detect a problem autonomously and start the recovery procedure autonomously. And under the disaster recovery procedure itself, it's usually in traditional uh, setups, it's usually a mix of manual and automated tasks. Uh, if you're very good, maybe they're all automated, it's just the initial trigger is manual, but other, otherwise it's a mix. In Cloud Native DR, it must be, everything must be automated. And then the two main metrics regarding disaster recovery, which are RTO and RPO, right? The recovery time objective is how long it takes to, for your system or service to come back up after a disaster. And the recovery point objective is how back in time uh, do you your your uh, data goes in terms of you know transactions that you lost because of the disaster? So for transitional disaster recovery, we you have between zero and a few hours, you know, depending uh, depending on on the disaster recovery procedure for for for, uh, for RTO for recovery time objective. But for cloud native disaster recovery, we want it to be close to zero. And essentially, it's not zero just because there are some health checks that need to they need to detect that uh, there is a problem in one of your availability zone or in one of your failure domains, and these health checks then start directing the traffic to the healthy locations. And then for recovery point objective, again, depending on how you implement your traditional DR, it could be from zero to hours. But for disaster recovery, uh, for, for cloud native disaster recovery we want it to be ex uh, exactly zero, uh, especially for strong, strongly consistent um, middleware. Um, and then who is the owner of the disaster recovery process? So in terms of business continuity, the formal owner is always the application or the service, but what often happens in, uh, in traditional organization is that the uh, the application team just looks at the storage teams and 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 inherits uh, their um, their disaster recovery procedure. So the de facto owner ends up being the storage team. For cloud native disaster recovery, we want the application team to be the owner. They will design, they will use the underlying platform capability capabilities to design their disaster recovery procedure. But they are the owner of the disaster recovery procedure. And then what capabilities do we need? What technical capabilities do we need? Historically, disaster recovery has always been um, a part of uh, implemented with storage capability, like backup and restore or volume replication, whether it's a synchronous or synchronous. But what we found out implementing this cloud native disaster recovery architecture is that uh, we needed the capability mostly from the networking domain and especially the ability to, to do east-west communication so that we could stand up cluster of storage um, or middleware, cluster of middleware, you know, uh, uh, 
stateful middleware across different uh, regions or different failure domains, and then that we needed strong, uh, smart global load balancers. So global load balancers that have L checks and are able to swing the traffic when there is a disaster. Okay, next slide, please. So what can you find in, in this white paper? So we have this um, cloud native disaster recovery approach definition, um, explain a little bit with more detail than what I just did. And then we have uh, some um, uh, fundamental definitions of the terminology that we use in the white paper, like failure domain, HA, HA and DR. Then we talk about the CAP theorem, which is uh, the theorem that underpins the behavior of state of work of distributed state of workloads, which is what we want to we need to use if we want to go with active active approaches. Then we look take a look at the anatomy of these distributed state of workloads. They all have similar um, characteristics, so it's worth knowing what they are um, by by understanding what replicas, shards, and shards are, I, you can easily figure out the, the behavior, the, the most, um, the high level characteristics of your work, of, of, of a workload. And then um, we look at the consensus protocols, uh, which these, these are the way that these replicas and shards coordinate. Um, so we take a look at Paxos, Raft, and, and this is the most common consensus protocols. And then we have some reference architecture for cloud native disaster recovery deployments with two flavors, strong consistency and eventual consistency. Next slide. Here is an example of um, what, what you can find in, in the white paper. This is a slide about the anatomy of uh, uh, cloud native uh, um, of, of stateful workloads, distributed stable workloads. And as you can see, we have uh, we have usually three layers, uh, an API layer that exposes the a capability like messaging or SQL. Um, and then we have a coordination layer, which is used to coordinate replicas and uh, shards. And then we have a storage layer, which is actually interacting with volumes and persisting the, the data. And when you have multiple of these instances, because we have you have both replicas and shards, um, you need um, you need protocols and you need coordination protocols between these instances. And this is where uh, inter-replica state synchronization come into play, or interpartition coordination come into play. So we go in, in the details of the, what the options are there. Next slide. And we also have a little analysis of the most common products, uh, distributed uh, stateful workloads products that are out there. These are all open source. And um, what they use for the consensus protocol between replicas and what they use for the shard consensus protocol. And you can see some of them don't have shards, but when you have shards, you need, if, if there is an operation that a transaction or an operation that um, involves multiple shards, there needs to be a way to uh, coordinate those shards. Uh, next slide. And here is an example of uh, the reference architectures that we have. This is a way, a very high level way of deploying a state of workload in, a, in Kubernetes across multiple data centers, or if you will, across multiple geographies. Um, so you see there are multiple Kubernetes cluster. There's this, this stateful workload with persistent volumes. Of course, you can have multiple replicas. As you can see from the yellow arrows, bidirectional arrows, this stateful workload, they need to communicate with each other. So you need to have an east-west um, strategy, communication strategy. Maybe it's a tunnel, maybe it's some other networking uh, capability, but they need to be able to talk to each other. And then you may, you probably have a front end application and some way of ingressing traffic from the outside from the uh, for clients for the, of this application. And uh, you need a global load balancer that is smart enough such that when, for, for example, maybe if you lose data center number one, you know, traffic will not be um, 
directed there and all the traffic will be redirected to data center Chwindry. Here we have three data centers because of the CAP theorem, we need at least three instances to have a, a leader election, a successful leader election, which is what all of these uh, strongly consistent uh, state of workload need in order to function correctly. On, on the left, on the right side, we have uh, we discussed also the example of uh, what happens if you have a network partitioning, and what's what's the behavior in, in the case of a stateful, uh, strongly consistent state of workload. The the partition that has the minority and cannot elect the leader will uh, take itself offline, and so the the global balancer also in this case need, needs to be able to detect that situation and just send the traffic to the uh, data centers that are still able to work. Next slide. And back to you, Alex. Thank you, Raffaele. Um, so on this last slide, we'll um, just reinforce um, our, our drive to continue to grow our community and to welcome you to, to join our community. Um, we'd love to see uh, more of you join the storage tag meetings and um, and help contribute, whether you're on the um, project side or whether you just have a, a technical interest um, in, in storage. But also joining our calls is, is a good way of um, finding out about other projects in the ecosystem and uh, understanding more about block stores, file systems, databases, key value stores, and a huge variety of other uh, systems. Um, finally, if you um, if you want to uh, help contribute to the tag itself, um, you can consider a role with the tag either as a, as a tech lead or or perhaps as a, as a co chair in the future. Um, I would love to hear more from you if you'd like to contribute. So, we hope to see you soon, and thank you for joining our presentation.